Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, nice that you are interested in the uh, topic of uh, uh, the basic income. Um, I'm actually assistant professor at the University of Waterloo and Bolzano, um, and my interest is in entrepreneurship, technology management, and innovation. And uh, very often I'm asked, um, what does a basic income have to do with entrepreneurship? And the answer I always give is, ask entrepreneurs. Because if they start a company, most often they cannot do what they want because they have financial constraints. And one reason I like Ken Robinson's talks so much is that he designs a world how it can be with a basic income. Because a basic income provides the freedom, like Rousseau said, and freedom does not mean that you can do what you want, but it means that you cannot be forced to do what you don't want. And I think that's what things are about. So uh, I did my PhD uh, on how to finance a basic income. So we'll talk a bit, little bit about how to finance it. There are basically four ways, four ways to finance a basic income. One is uh, from income taxation. That is the most straightforward way. One is from consumption taxation. That's the most instructive way, which is why I'll talk a little bit more about that today, uh, because that's where we can learn most about how the mechanisms of the basic income work. The, th the third one is uh, financing it through a resource tax. I just uh, have a book that came out in Springer Publishing last week that has a full chapter on how that can be uh, financed so, or how, how that can be um, realized. So if you're interested in that topic, please send me an email and I can send you all the detail, details. And the fourth um, approach is financing it through something like a monetary tax. And if you want, we'll can we can talk about that a little later. But uh, the, the basic program first will be uh, on the uh, on the value-added tax uh, financing of the basic income. And uh, so, to start with, uh, maybe, you know, we don't have a bottle here, so let, well, let me use a glass of water, and let us imagine that I had bought that glass of water for a euro and 20. And when I would ask you now, how much taxes have I paid uh, in this one euro and 20? What would you say? How many of you would say, well, we have the one euro net and then we have 20 cents about value added tax? So, how many of you would say um, 20 cents? Okay, we can already see we have a very highly educated uh, audience because most, most of the time um, people would say, or most people would say, here this was a minority, most of the time most people would say this is just the 20%. And in fact, if you look at the glass, it's actually true at the first glance that what you see is what you pay, so the 20% value added tax. But what most, most of us don't have in mind is that in this so-called um, net price, there are the taxes of the whole value creation. So anyone who was working to produce that water to process it, it pay, has an income paid and pays income tax. So all that is only paid because someone bought this uh, glass of water. And this is a dramatic change in the way business is done compared to how it was done 100, no, 200 years ago. So, 200 years ago, today is 2015, uh, 200 years ago, 1815, how many people, what percentage of people was working and living in farming? Any guesses? 90%, yeah, that's about it. In England, was a little bit less because they are very early in industrialization, but roughly 80 to 90 percent. And the rest was aristocracy, some clerics, some academics, and but 80, 90 percent were in um, farming. Now, how many live and work today in farming? Five percent. It's even less than that. It's 3% if you count forestry to, to that, but if you limit it to farming, it's just 2%. So, 
what has changed, and I always ask myself, how can I bring this down to a simple graph to remember it? Now, at the same time, you can, you can draw a graph where you uh, start with 1850 uh, and reduce the number of people um, working in farming. I found an, an additional chart more instructive, but that covers the same um, period of time. So 2015 this year, 1815 some time ago. And here, the market volume. And what you can see, actually, in the in this slide here, oh, it's already there. So I pushed the button. Okay, so uh, no problem. Then, well, basically that's it. So what you can see is that we have an increase in market volume, and that is because if 80, 90 percent of people live in farming, you don't need to buy so much. What you what you grow is what you eat. Now today most of what we consume, actually almost everything we consume, is produced by others. Some people would say, because all religions say, the, 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 the main thing is that we work for others, so carry the burden of others. Some people would go so far and say, this is the realization of uh, the religious idea of brotherhood. We all work for each other, but we do it in a consciousness that we work for ourselves, for our income. So that's a major paradigm shift uh, that might be required to understand uh, what's going on in economy today. Because whether we can think it like that, whether we can see it, whether we like it, all we do today, we do for others, functionally. Of course, we need money to be able to do it, so we are getting paid. And we have, of course, also a performance variety there, so we have differences in income. But regardless, labor division means I work for others. So, as a consequence, um, economies look different today than uh, they looked 200 years ago. Now, if I 50 years ago would have said, Every piece of cloth that you have that was not produced in Germany, take it off, no one would have moved. If I would say the same today, everyone would take his clothes off because they're not produced in Germany anymore. So we have a global, this is true for a global labor division. So when we look at the um, way um, economy takes place today, every economic um, activity starts by extracting something that we find in nature. And this is something that most economic and business students know. We have the value creation chain, and the purpose of everything we do in economics is consumption. Now you can go one step further and say, well, what do we need consumption for? Co consumption is not la pour la, so we don't consume to consume. So what is it for? Consumption is the basis for the cultural development of mankind, and we are part of that um, development. So what we see here from the left-hand side to the right-hand side is the value creation process. And because we always speak of an economic circle, we need, of course, a circular movement. So the price that we pay for everything we consume dissolves entirely into private incomes. That's also, in particular, for business and economic students, sometimes difficult to believe because they say, ah, but there is taxes and there is natural resources which are getting paid, but what does a kilo of oil and coal cost? Nothing. Because God does not send a bill, neither for the sun nor for the wind. So the natural resource itself is always free. What we pay, and of course we pay for coal and oil, what we pay is always to the people from whom we buy it. So, what you can see, if you look at that, is um, that quite naturally, whether, again, economists sometimes have problems believing that, but the, the cost of all value creation is contained in the price, and therefore also the, val the value-added tax and all the other taxes. So... When we think about the taxation system today and we think about general politics, we always call for um, transparency. And the only tax that makes transparent the actual amount of taxes that are 
contained in a product is the value-added tax. So this is one reasoning why some people say we should, we could actually shift all taxes, not all, we should keep one income tax, the income tax on windfall profits uh, and resource rents, which are scarcity rents, no one worked for that, but we just pay for something because it's scarce. So that should be taxed uh, heavily, in fact. But all other income taxes, because they are a part of this value creation and a part of the price, should go away. Because with the income tax, we kind of hinder the production. In a society where we work for each other, what I want is to have all traffic lights on green that we can work for each other, rather than reducing uh, the incentive to work for each other. So if we, for a quick moment, jump into uh, an idea or a world, maybe if we would start now, we could be done in 20 years, where there is no other tax except value-added tax, there would not be something like black labor, because where there is no tax, you don't need to, to avoid uh, taxes. But, uh, and there also would not have to be something like a... Um, tax exempt amount, an income tax exempt amount, because where you don't pay tax, you don't need a tax exemption. But if you have only the value added tax, we need to talk about a tax exempt amount for the value added tax. And how does that work? Technically, rather simple. The only thing you need to do is to exempt the minimum amount that you consume from taxation. So in today's figures, we have um, about six to 700 euros minimal consumption per month. That is what you get from authorities if you have no other income, sometimes even more than that, but it's between six and 700 uh, euros in general. And we know that it's about 10% value-added tax contained in there because we have a reduced value-added tax uh, for um, goods everyone needs. So, in other words, to make the existence level tax exempt as we have it today already for the income tax, to make it tax exempt for the value added tax too, we would need to pay out 60 or 70 euros per month to every person living in this country. Um, and that should and could be done today. And there you already have um, a basic income. Now, if you have shifted uh, all taxes, uh, towards a value-added tax, then 60 or 70 euros would, would of course not be enough, but it would be, for instance, say, uh, 500 uh, euros a month. And as soon as you have this unconditional basic income high enough to cover your costs uh, of living, then you uh, will see um, a development in society where people can allow themselves increasingly to do what they really, really want and think uh, they should be doing. I give you an example for that, and that's called actually technically um, um, substitutional or substitutions. You pay out the basic income substitutionally. The average income today in, in Germany uh, is about 2,500 euros. It's a little bit more than that uh, nowadays, but it's roughly that figure. So the average net income from that is 1,500 euros. If we would have a basic income of 500 euros, most people, when they hear that, they would think, oh, I get the 500 euros in addition to what I'm having. That way, it would be difficult to finance it. I will show you now a way how to finance it very easily through a substitutional payoff. So in other words, if you have a net income of 1,500 1, euros and a basic income of 500 euros, those 500 euros basic income reduce your net income. So you altogether have 1,500 euros at the end of the month, but 500 as a basic income. Now, when I saw that for the first time, I thought to myself, well, then it doesn't change too much, does it? But at a second thought, it changes quite a lot. Because today, if you work full five days a week and you have 1,500 euros monthly net income, you get for each workday work, about 300 euros. So when you decide you want to work a day less, you lose 300 euros. The same thing with the basic income, you have 1,000 from your general income and 500 basic income, you just lose 200 
uh, euros when you decide to stay at home a day. So the higher the basic income is, of course, uh, the more people can afford liberty and freedom and to decide uh, for themselves. And because I see we are uh, running a little bit out of time, um, no? Okay. Okay, so I, I go on, um, but still let me um, then uh, conclude here at least with a first um, consideration how much, well, how much it actually costs, because some people then start to calculate, oh, 500 or 800 or 1,000 euros for Germany for 80 million people, that makes 800, no, wait, eight, 80 billion um, um, a month and then almost a trillion uh, per year. And that would be true if you pay it out in an additional way, so on top of everything that we have now. What I just explained and what we suggest is to pay it out not additionally but substitutionally. And to illustrate that, the easiest method I found is if we shortly imagine that we all are sitting in a huge stadium and we are on the tribune of that huge stadium. It's a concept that goes back to the sociologist uh, Ian Penn from the 60s. And it's that, uh, therefore it's called Penn's Parade. And so we are all in a, in a, in a, uh, on a tribune in a huge stadium. And the economy comes walking in. So everyone, eight for Germany, so now 80 million people come walking in. And everyone is as high as her or his income. So first of all, you have a long parade of people with small income, then you have the parade of the medium-sized incomes, and in the end you have one or two minutes a parade of the giants. So after an hour the whole economy has entered the stadium, and what you would see very roughly is something like that. So you have the giants here and the small incomes there. If you turn that around, it looks like this graph, and from that you can see the income uh, distribution of uh, the population in very general terms. And that helps us to understand how much or how little a basic income actually costs. You see here this, you know, uh, part of this parade, so to speak. The giants are cut away because they have s so outrageously high incomes that, you know, it, it's beyond the graph. So, uh, but you, what you see here, and when we talk about the basic income, we focus mostly on those who do not have uh, much income or are below the b what we suggest for a basic income. So, um, when we think about how much it actually costs to pay out a basic income here, I think it's in the example of 900 euros, you would not have to pay 900 euros at, in, net, in terms of net. Of course, you pay it to everyone, but the additional money you need to pay that to everyone is much lower because most people already have uh, the 900 euros. So you pay it in a substitutional way only to those you pay it to everyone, but additional money is only needed for those who are below that amount today. And that is about this uh, piece, and that is about um, uh, roughly uh, two... Um, well, it depends actually, but it's, it's about eight, um, uh, eight um, billion euros per year. So one or about one per month. And uh, so that is an amount that can be easily financed and that takes away the fear that it would be so expensive to finance um, a basic income. Now, this is just um, a general sketch of the idea. Let me shortly talk about um, um, the way to finance it from an income tax because that maybe even lighter fits into our today's thinking. That was suggested by Milton Friedman in 1962. And he suggested, I'll do it for the US figures, he suggested in 1962 to uh, introduce a regime that combines taxation and social welfare. And he said everyone who has below 600 uh, euros, uh, US dollars, I'm sorry, US dollars a month, um, should have for each US dollar below 650 cents from the government. So in the end, if you had no income, you would have 300 US dollars. And in 1962, that allows you to live a decent 
uh, but um, uh, a life in dignity. Um, today, that would be probably maybe a thousand euros or US dollars, but at that time, 1962, if you talk to your grandparents, you know what the relations were. So 300 US dollars at that time you know, brought you through the month. And mathematically, it's absolutely the same whether you say, I look at what people earn and then what they don't earn, I give them. You can do it that way or you can do it in a much easier way. You say, I pay the 300 US dollars or to th today a thousand um, to everyone and everything that she or he earns in addition is being taxed by, for instance, he suggested 50%. Now, 50% sounds rather high. But because you always get your uh, basic income, the net uh, burden is, neg is where you actually pay, you actually get more than you pay until you reach uh, a certain amount, uh, for instance, a thousand um, euros or US dollars. So because you have a basic income, um, the tax burden is not actually 50%, even though you pay 50% taxes, because you get this uh, money on a monthly basis. So um, that is um, the general idea for the income taxation. Yeah.